Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 159. This week the questions are taken from the Wednesday video on the Type 93 Long Lance Torpedo and Guide 215 on the unique Russian destroyer Tashkent. Galdir Ioni asks, did any navy ever consider purpose building a ship for the kind of high risk, high speed supply dash evacuation runs that Tashkent, or the Japanese destroyers at Guadalcanal or other islands, ended up doing? I'm not aware of anybody purpose building one for that kind of mission. There were a number of other high speed ships, like you mentioned, the Japanese use of destroyers at Guadalcanal, the use of the Abdiel class mine layers in the Mediterranean, and the conversion of a number of older US destroyers to effectively fast transport ships, which all fulfill that kind of criteria, but they're all conversions or use of existing vessels that weren't purpose built. As far as I'm aware, I think there were a few navies that looked at the idea in principle, but didn't end up actually building anything in practice. Now, I could be wrong, there could be a niche, fast, ultra high, fast, speed, high, trans. That was a horrible sentence. Ultra high speed, fast transport vessel. And yeah, maybe they built one or two or something, but I haven't come across them personally. And I think it's generally for the reason that, well, to be perfectly honest, that kind of mission is generally done when you're losing. And most navies don't like to consider about building a ship specifically for a period when they're losing or potentially under just a lot of pressure. Uh, they'd rather build a ship that's more offensive and then, if necessary, repurpose it for a purely defensive kind of role. But also, it's a very niche specialist area. And so peacetime budgets, which are usually restricted normally don't stretch to building a ship that's designed for one very specific purpose within one very specific context because whilst you know transport is a thing navies do build transport ships and they even build what are called high speed transport ships they're high speed for general cargo and merchant ships the problem with building something that's going to hit 35 plus knots whilst carrying cargo is that it is going to be in World War II only around about destroyer size and that means it's not going to carry an awful lot of cargo and supplies it's just going to be able to carry some which is obviously better than nothing but it's it, it, it kind of takes the niche from transport down to transport under a particular set of circumstances and as I say in peacetime the budget's not there for that kind of incredibly niche proposition usually and in wartime well you use what you've got rather than go through a full design process for this again one very specific niche use unsc forward on to dawn asks you said in a previous dry dock or live stream that one of your other hobbies is railways can you combine the two and do a special on naval dockyard railways Yes, Naval Dockyard Railways are a fairly vital and important part of Naval Dockyard infrastructure, and I have mentioned them in the past uh, in various videos, but they probably do deserve a special of their own. They will be getting a lot more heavily featured in an upcoming Wednesday video later this year uh, because I managed to get to the Chatham Dockyards with the very kind help and assistance of, obviously, Chatham Historic Dockyard themselves. Uh, you should definitely go and visit them if you can and you happen to be in the UK at the moment, and also with uh, the help of another channel, um, Laurie's Mechanical Marvels, also a very good channel to go and watch if you like all things mechanical, um, who worked with Chatham Dockyard and myself to, to get access in there. And one of the nice things about the Chatham Historic Dockyard is, whilst it's not as extensive a network as it used to be, they do still have a working, as you can see here, section of the dockyard's rail system and whilst the traces of that system are present in some other dockyards that have been preserved it's usually not anywhere near as as well preserved for example if you go to Portsmouth Historic Dockyard the track lines are still visible but there's nothing running whereas at Chatham as you can see they are so when I do the video on Chatham there will be a lot more covering um, that that aspect of things but in addition to that 
um, there will be at some point a video about generally dockyard railways but that will require a bit more research on my part as well as some more hunting around to see what other bits and pieces of various naval dockyards I can find. Crazy Diamond Requiem asks, how thick would the battleship Bismarck's armour belt, deck, etc. be if it was designed with an all-or-nothing armour scheme, assuming it had the same displacement as the original? Well, using a very crude estimate in Spring Sharp, assuming that you get rid of the end armour, except for protection for steering, and you get rid of the upper belt, and you just thicken the main belt, you can push the main belt up to somewhere between 15 and a half and 16 inches on the same displacement. And that's assuming that you've um, evened out the turtle back to a single armoured deck immediately above the main belt. Now, obviously, that means that you can also play around with the design in different ways because you might want to extend the main belt higher, in which case you're going to have to thin it back down again somewhat uh, to get a taller main belt because you no longer have that thinner upper belt above it. But if you're just going to go directly with a eliminate all other um, side armour apart from the main belt armour and then thicken that up with uh, the aforementioned flat armour deck above it, then yeah, 15 and a half to 16 inches quite easily without any other major changes. Man Cub WWA asks, when answering the frigate versus ship of the line career question, you focused on the captains, but what about the junior officers? Did they ever have a chance of choosing their posting in any way? I read somewhere that, save for family political connections, the easiest way to get your own command was to command a crew bringing a prize home, something much easier to achieve when serving on a frigate, Whilst on a ship of the line, even in battle, it was quite hard for a lieutenant, let alone a midshipman, to distinguish himself and get noticed. So what determined postings, and how did the Royal Navy ensure frigates did not get all the good junior officers? Or did the frigates get all the good junior officers? It could vary wildly. Um, this is very common, a common feature in the Age of Sail. So sometimes a junior officer or a set of junior officers would either follow or would be taken with a captain to a new posting if they had the swing and they particularly liked those officers. Other times it would be down to what had the Admiralty assessed your capabilities as having strengths in because they might note that some of your qualities as a junior officer might be more suited for frigate work or more suited for ship of the line work and assign you thus. It might also simply be the tyranny of what was available. If you've, say, recently passed your lieutenant's exam and, you know, the Admiralty wants you to get out and onto a ship, well, if there's a ship that's crewing and has an opening, then you're getting assigned to that ship, whether you like it or not. And then, depending on how well you knew your commanding officer, his commanding officer, and so on, up to the relevant level of the food chain... You could also, within reason, ask for a transfer from one command to another, especially if a captain was changing at the same time. Obviously, this worked better the higher up the rank you were. A new midshipman was very unlikely to get his voice heard unless he had some very powerful, well-connected friends further up the line. Whereas, say, the first officer of a ship might very well have his plea listened to as long as he was in relative favour with the squadron or fleet commander. And of course, while you're at sea, again, if you maybe hadn't shown particular aptitude one way or another for the type of ship you wanted to be assigned to, you could work on those skills whilst you were at sea, especially in a time of war. And let's face it, during the Age of Sail, there was very often a time of war. And then if you met up with a squadron or fleet at some point, and perhaps there was another ship that had taken battle damage and casualties and was on the lookout for an officer who specialised in a particular thing that was relatively speaking niche to that vessel then or that type of vessel then you might find yourself in a position to go oh yes uh, well uh, sir relevant officer I have the uh, requisite skills so um, I might be able to serve his majesty better by being transferred obviously by the appropriate chain of command again and 
that might serve you relatively well. And the thing between frigates and ships of the line is that there were different levels of achievement and honour that might be gained in either one. And some of them appealed to some officers, some of them appealed to other officers, but a lot of the time officers would want a mixture of both. So yes, for example, in a frigate it was entirely possible that you could get very rich off of a string of many, 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 many prizes, but also frigate duty was very tiring, very stressful, very heavy work because you were constantly moving around at relatively decent clip. You had to play your tactics very close to your chest because whilst you were in a frigate and that was a rated warship, there were a lot of things out there that might be bigger and nastier than you, like, say, a third rate coming at you in heavy weather. Whereas if you were in a third rate, second rate or first rate, there were significantly fewer things around that where you might turn around and go, ah, time to run away. And the duties that you were undertaking might, in a lot of circumstances, be somewhat less stressful. Although, again, it can vary situation to situation. But whilst the opportunity for individual glory was perhaps more prevalent in frigates when it came to either battle or exploration, if you wanted to be able to say, oh yes, I was there at XYZ engagement that everybody knows about, then you really needed to be on a ship of the line most of the time because whilst, yeah, you could come back and say, oh yes, I fought, I fought Napoleon, I fought the French, I fought the Spanish and uh, we took many prizes and there were lots of little glorious gun actions and we ca I came home with plenty of money and that's why I have this nice house. That has a certain level of appeal in that society but equally someone who could turn around and say, oh, yes, I was with Nelson when he broke the line at Trafalgar, or I was with um, Admiral Jervis when, when we took the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent. That has a whole other level of social cachet and honour and reputation associated with it. So whilst some people were, like, say, Admiral Cochrane, perfectly happy to spend their entire lives tearing around in frigates, uh, basically stealing everything they could and burning everything they couldn't others who were looking for more social recognition back home would quite often eventually gravitate towards wanting to be in command of a larger vessel and so this kind of desire kept the quality of officers flowing back and forth between various commands plus of course whilst the prize money might add up very quickly if you're on a successful frigate the really 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 big single payouts which could change your life forever were perhaps slightly more common on ships of the line you could get that kind of payout on a frigate if you were lucky enough to catch a ship full of treasure or similar but um yeah, it's only the first rates that bring in the other first rates, and the prize money from capturing a, an enemy first rate or even a couple of third rates was immense. And uh, you've got to bear in mind that if multiple enemy ships surrendered and could be taken as prizes, depending on the circumstances of the engagement, you might end up with a ship of the line being able to claim partial prize money off of multiple captures. His dad, James, asks... Overall, then, was Tashkent a smartly designed warship or one unreasonably imbalanced in favour of speed versus firepower and protection and versatility? I mean, it's going to be very difficult to compare Tashkent to almost any other destroyer from the time period because the blasted thing is almost 3,000 tonnes standard, more than 3,000 tonnes fully loaded and over 4,000 tonnes when you really pack everything in the kitchen sink on it. In most other navies, especially at full load, you'd be calling that small cruiser. <laughs> in fact, it is heavier at full load than a number of World War I cruisers. And more powerful, actually, for that matter. Um, it just doesn't have quite as much protection. So it's, it's difficult to evaluate it in the context of World War II. And you've also got to appreciate that it was equipped within the limitations of what 
its Italian designers and the Russian or Soviet Navy that was going to own it could actually, you know, install and maintain. So when you look at it on balance for a pre-war design, albeit a very large pre-war design, it's fairly heavily armed. It can go toe-to-toe with anything up to and including the French uh, contre torpilleurs It's got actually on paper a pretty decent anti-aircraft armament albeit that it's the russian 45 millimeter aa gun that's not exactly a uh, gun to write home about anytime soon but again limitations of the equipment that they've got the only thing that i would really pick it up on specifically as designed within those caveats is the use of three triple torpedo launchers because, as you can see, that takes up quite a bit of deck space, pretty much from just after the first funnel to the aft twin mount, with very little else in between except for the second funnel. And that nets you a total of nine torpedoes. Personally, if I was designing it, I would rather go with a slightly rejigged layout that gave me two quad launchers, because two quad launchers would take up significantly less space. Yes, I lose one torpedo, but I save the weight of an entire triple launcher. I'm obviously increasing the other two launchers by one, so slightly increased weight there. But it then gives me also a lot more free deck space so that I can do something else with it. And this is bearing in mind, obviously, that the initial design brief was Big Fast Destroyer. So whilst it might be tempting to say, oh, yes, we'll reduce the machinery so you're going at a speed that's somewhat sane and not well north of 40 knots, well, that's what the Russians wanted. So <laughs> that's the main driver behind the size. But if you were to give me a kind of a, a blank slate almost and say, right, well, this is approximately the size and approximately the speed of a destroyer that we're going to build, how would you improve it? As I said, my first instinct would be to replace the three triples with two quads or if I'm expanding across to grabbing technology from all over the place maybe even two quintuple or pentad launchers because then you know again I'm still saving deck space and now have one more torpedo with that saved deck space I'd probably be tempted to introduce a fourth twin mounting and then Instead of the 130 mil guns, I mean, they're not awful, but I would realize that, you know, having two quads or two pentad launchers instead of three triples, that's not going to free up enough weight, even though it might free up enough space, to put a fourth twin 130 mil on. I would personally go for something in the lower half of the four inch range, maybe a uh, twin fours or twin 4.5s or something in that region purely because that lets me get two more guns and compared to almost all five inch and above guns with the exception of something like the five inch 38 it's going to buy me a much much higher rate of fire so if my big destroyer is supposed to kill lots of small destroyers having eight rapid fire guns of slightly smaller caliber is probably going to work out better than having six slower firing slightly larger weapons obviously you know replace the 45 mil with anything else um, practically i mean the russians have decent 37 mil later on but you know uh, well maybe don't take the german single shot 37 mil but almost any other medium anti-aircraft weapon put those on instead and upgrade the 12.7 mil machine guns to 20 millimeter somethings um those would be my main changes it doesn't change the overall balance of the ship that much it just marginally improves the utility of it at certain measures but that is kind of reaching into the big grand bag of available world war ii destroyer tech from across several nations so you can forgive them for that so whilst there is room for improvement i would say the overall concept of the tashkent design for what it is a phenomenally large destroyer verging on a small cruiser is actually relatively smart and well thought out especially when you take into consideration the equipment restrictions that they faced jacob flome asks 
Why is it that the US Navy didn't move for 15-inch guns in the middle or latest classes of the standards? I understand the economy of scale argument for the 14-inch, and the Japanese didn't adopt the 15-inch either. However, would there be any net positive for the US Navy if, say, the Pennsylvania class had eight 15-inch guns instead, and the New Mexico's or Tennessee's were 10 15-inch gun designs? Does a heavier shell do anything to improve the overall design despite reducing the overall weight of fire? There would be improvements. A 15-inch gun is necessarily going to have better penetration, better range, and a greater bursting charge, etc., as compared to a 14-inch gun, assuming that you're following what you could loosely describe as the same tech tree. I, it's the same navy, possibly even the same gun manufacturer, just building a bigger gun. So the gun itself will be somewhat more powerful. However, there is the issue of you know, overall weight of fire and number of shells out there. And that number of shells, especially in the World War I context, does make a difference. Because if you're throwing eight shells, so you've got eight chances of hitting, you throw 12 shells, you've got 12 chances of hitting, that much seems obvious. But bearing in mind that you know, World War I fire control is not the same as World War II fire control, and obviously World War II fire control in 1939-1940 is a very different piece to what it is in 1944-1945, so having more guns increases the chances of you hitting by a considerable amount. I mean, 8 to 12 guns is an increase of 50% in terms of barrels. And you see this almost immediately in practically everybody's dreadnoughts. You start off with 8-gun broadsides, but even when they're sticking to the 12-inch guns, very quickly it goes to 10 or 12-gun broadsides, and when you go, oh, and everyone starts moving up a level to larger weapons, for example, the three British classes of 13.5-inch gunships, they will have 10 guns. The Japanese with the Fusos obviously go for 12. The Americans, uh, after a short dalliance with 10 guns on the Texas and Nevadas, and New York, obviously, they go for 12 guns as well. So the main reason that the Queen Elizabeths have eight guns is actually because of their speed. There was a Queen Elizabeth design prepared which looked kind of just like a larger Iron Duke, so it had 10 15 inch guns, but they ended up going for a design that dropped one turret effectively in exchange for more machinery. It was sort of a bit more complex than that, but that was the, the general equation in order to get up to the higher speed. And they found happily that, you know, having eight 15-inch guns still gave them more broadside weight of fire than 10 13.5-inch guns anyway. But the thing with that is that, roughly speaking, a 1.5 inches of increase in calibre seems to be about the minimum in which you can go up a up in size and still reduce the number of guns down somewhat and still have an overall slightly greater weight of fire and so that means that you can go from 12 plus 12 inch guns to 10 13.5 inch guns to 8 15 inch guns and still have an incremental increase in broadside weight whereas if you're just going up by one inch in caliber you get some marginal benefits in what we mentioned before range penetration bursting charge etc but the increased weight of the gun, because of the square cube law, means that you have to drop the number of guns unless you make your ship considerably larger. And the drop in number of guns means that the overall weight of firepower is somewhat less. And that's not particularly desirable. So you tend to see, with the exception of the Germans, who like being their own special case, everyone else effectively goes up in either 1.5 or 2 inch increments so the Japanese go 12, 14, 16 and then with the Yamato's 18 the Americans go 12, 14, 16 they look at 18 and they decide lots of 16 is better the British interestingly they actually do follow this 1.5 inch increment rule at least in their design concepts so they go 12, 13.5, 15 they look into 16.5, they don't actually end up building one or going for it, but they do look into it quite seriously, 
the next step logically up from that is 18 and then you get the 20 inch guns which Fischer almost managed to get built for incomparable but that's Fischer being Fischer. The Germans incidentally do overall follow a roughly British pattern with some slight variance. You've got the 11 to 12 inch move at the beginning but then after that they go from that to looking at something in the region of 13 point something depending on exactly which gun you're referencing um usually 13.8 then they go to 15 then they look for like l20 el for 16.5s and then that's where it cuts off because you know the imperial german navy ceases to exist Stephen asks, given the centrality of the stab in the back myth to Nazi ideology, was the Kriegsmarine ever able to shake the stigma associated with the Kiel mutiny? If not, how did this stigma affect the Navy's influence within the High Command? Now, I must admit the stab in the back myth is not something I'm an expert on. I mean, it is mostly an army land-based thing. And it's also a socio-political thing, um, neither of which are my particular areas of expertise. However, from what I understand, from what I've read about the Kriegsmarine, it, the Kiel mutiny doesn't feature quite so much and so obviously in various um, considerations when it comes to where that how much they can influence high command. For one thing, Germany has always had the army kind of predominant for obvious reasons it's got uh, land borders on three sides and it's in the middle of europe the navy uh, naval element of Ger the german equation is not really anywhere near as key as it is for other countries and then you've got the air force competing as well in the uh, 1930s but the other thing, again, at least as far as I understand, is that one of the key components of the stab in the back myth was that the German army, the military, was there fighting, ready to go on, and rah, 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 and all the other propaganda. And it was the people back home that effectively betrayed them. Whereas with the Kiel mutiny, it's not anyone outside of the navy that's doing the mutinying, it's the actual soldiers or sailors in this particular case it's the military itself that's putting tools down and saying no we're not going anywhere at which point it's much harder to um it's much harder for someone to come up with a stab in the back myth and propaganda when you know you're the ones who would be stabbing yourselves in the back i guess theoretically um it, it, that is much more a case of, I guess, if you want to look at the uh, in in terms of later propaganda, of going, ah, yes, well, these particular people within the navy were unpatriotic, communist, socialist, Bolshevik, etc., etc., etc. But we've got rid of them now, and now the navy is full of you know loyal members of the Third Reich or some other silly nonsense. So. Um, I think it's it was easier for the Kriegsmarine to make a clean cut away from that than it was for the German army to make, uh, and the German populace generally, to get away from the stab in the back myth, not to mention obviously the fact the Nazis were intensifying that particular element of the myth, and the their Germans, when they're looking at the army performance, they kind of have to come up with an explanation that squares the circle of wanting to believe that they could still fight, but also having fallen back quite considerably during the Allied Hundred Days Offensive, whereas for the German Navy, they could, in terms of actual action, whilst, yes, they spent a lot of the time sitting around in port, they could point to a number of successful operations and, of course, the eternally fought over who won the Battle of Jutland controversy, which overall put them in a slightly stronger light, if you like, compared to the army, which had a lot of things to try and explain and cover up. Night Corps Rules asks, How would the Battle of Taffy 3 have looked if it was a Royal Navy task force in place of the US Navy? Could... British destroyers and support elements have affected a similar outcome in any way, regardless of external factors. I think it's going to depend on exactly how you match up the forces, because, well, 
an escort carrier is an escort carrier is an escort carrier. Yes, the aircraft might change slightly, but overall that's probably going to be a, a wash in 1944. But it's the destroyers that are probably going to be the single largest um, difference when you're looking at the British compared to the Americans. And that's because what kind of destroyer do you substitute in? If you're substituting in a kind of like-for-like like in terms of role, uh, then the Fletcher is kind of the go-to fleet destroyer for the US Navy so, and, you know, a, a modern advanced design. So if you want a modern advanced design fleet destroyer for the Royal Navy, I'm not actually going to say the Tribals because the Tribals were a bit of a one-off. What you're probably actually going to be looking at is the either the J, K, N, L, M uh, classes and well and the N class and by and large those are relatively comparable to the Fletchers they're fast uh, they have multiple torpedo launchers They've got two quad torpedo launchers and they have six guns so one more than the Fletchers in twin mounts and they're using the 4.7 inch now obviously the 4.7 inch is not quite as good as the 5 inch 38 in an anti-air roll but that doesn't matter we're talking about an anti-surface roll and if you go for that sort of J through N class destroyer, it's possible they might actually do slightly better than the Fletchers. Not massively so, uh, but the 4.7 inch is a slightly better anti-surface weapon than the 5 inch, and there's one more gun. The flip side is that, as I say, being in twin mounts and being a long barrel 4.7, their rate of fire is slightly slower than the 5 inch 38, which could be fairly important and also being in only three mounts that means the loss of any one mount loses two guns instead of one so then you've got to take that into consideration now both the Fletchers and this though that series of British destroyers do have radar fire control systems you've got the type 285 radar on the um, various British destroyers that you could sub in in that bracket and then of course you've got the radar twinned with the mark 37 fire control on the fletchers so it's kind of going to be a question of the individual 4.7 inch shells perhaps hitting a little bit harder on the japanese cruisers and destroyers versus them not necessarily hitting quite as often because their rate of fire is slightly slower so you you could make an argument that those destroyers might do fractionally better assuming you have a similar caliber of crew as you know Johnston and Captain Evans and the accompanying other vessels or they might do slightly worse depending on on that gunnery question then if you want to look at exact I suppose time period equivalents i.e. Fletcher start building in 41 so what's the Royal Navy building in 41 and onwards well then it gets a little bit more interesting because what the Royal Navy is building in 41 42 43 is their emergency flotillas and those destroyers are significantly smaller and less well armed so they've still got the two quad launchers for the most part depending on which emergency flotilla you're looking at but most of them do um but now they're down to four 4.7 inch guns um so you've got the 4.7 inch gun but you've got one less gun instead of one more gun they've still got radar mostly two type 285 for uh, surface gunnery control but overall they are smaller and less capable vessels than a fletcher or indeed the preceding fleet destroyers so if you go for the, the, I guess, the temporal like-for-like, like, the British forces overall will do somewhat worse because their rate of fire and weight of fire and number of guns is less. Torpedoes pretty much a wash, and as is gunnery, but they're just not going to be hitting the Japanese as hard, so worse outcome. Whereas if you've got the, the bigger fleet destroyers, the pre-war ones in, then, as I say, there might be an argument that they might they might hit the Japanese cruisers a little bit harder they might not but it, that's a bit more up in the air airplane master one asks 
what exactly brought about the Blackburn skewer's reputation as a bad aircraft? From what I can gather, though I must be missing something, it seemed rather par for the course for its day, or did superstition just rear its ugly head at the wrong time? I think it comes down again to something I've pointed out often when it comes to comparing the US and Japanese and British carrier aviation air wings, simply a fact that the British carrier aviation force had to go to war in 1939 with what it had, and due to the demands of war was pretty much stuck with what it was issued in 39 for a considerable period of time, whereas the US and Japanese had another effectively couple of years to update their carrier fleets and get everything sorted so this is that time period is exactly where you see the introduction of all these aircraft that people go oh yes well they had these aircraft they're clearly superior to the british and i keep having to point out well yes and if the british had had to go to war in december 7th 1941 the fleet air arm would have had considerably more advanced designs on their carriers as well but when it comes to the blackburn skewer there is one other major issue with it which is that it tried to be a combination aircraft, and whilst later in the war combination torpedo and dive bomber aircraft would prove quite successful, the skewer tried to be a combination dive bomber and fighter, which meant, you know, it had a rear gunner, so it's two-person aircraft, it's got the ability to carry dive bombers. Uh, bombs for dive bombing so it's got to be somewhat larger than is otherwise desirable for a fighter and it's trying to do the fighter role now <laughs> that doesn't quite work out i mean dauntless is technically a scout aircraft and yes there are occasions where dauntless is tried to dogfight but it generally doesn't work very well occasionally it does but it's kind of the exception that proves the rule everyone applauds the dauntless pilot who manages to dogfight his way out of a situation specifically because um well it's quite a remarkable achievement, and the Dauntless is a considerably newer design than the Skewer. And it's one of the things people forget. Aircraft design advances incredibly quickly, both in the immediate run-up to and during the Second World War. So if you compare the Skewer with its contemporaries in um, 1938, when it's first introduced into Fleet Air Arms Service, it's competing in the dive bomber category with the D-1A and the D-1A-2 in the Japanese fleet and the SBC-4, the biplane Curtis Helldiver in the US fleet. The skewer compares fairly favourably. It's middle of the pack for maximum speed. It's got the highest cruise speed. It's got the longest range. It's got by far the heaviest gun armament for combat and the bomb load is roughly equivalent with the D1A2. The Helldiver uh, biplane can take a 1,000-pound bomb, as opposed to the other two, which can only take 500-pound bombs, but that's really the only major area that the skewer loses out in. Now, when you compare it with the contemporary fighters, which it's also competing with because it's supposed to be a fighter dive bomber, that's the F3F in the US Navy and the A5M in the Japanese Navy, Surprisingly enough, the skewer still has some advantages. It's still by far the more heavily armed craft. Its range is comparable with the A5M, although the F3F can go further. But where it starts to lose out is speed. Uh, both the A5M and the F3F are considerably faster than it at top speed, albeit that the skewer is still middle of the pack when it comes to cruise speed. And both of the other fighters can fly considerably higher than it can. And they can get there far faster as well, because uh, they've got a higher rate of climb. So whilst the skewer is sort of a good modern frontline dive bomber um, and close to being top of the pack in when in that category, when it comes to being a fighter, it's not so brilliant. It's one advantage really is that because it's a retractable undercarriage monoplane fighter it has a slightly higher cruising speed and it's got this heavy forward armament plus the rear gun which means it's got overall more firepower the other two aircraft are going to be able to dance all over it in terms of maneuverability um but should they end up in the gun sights of the skewer the skewer is going to be able to take them down a lot faster than vice versa it's just that the vice versa is probably going to happen more often than not i suppose at that point you can argue that you've 
if someone is on your tail, at least the skewer has a tail gunner to shoot back, which the other two don't. But, you know, it's kind of by the time someone's on your tail, something's already gone badly wrong. And the other thing you've got to consider is when the skewer hits war service, by the standards of the day, it is basically already obsolete or sh should soon be withdrawn because you look at it, it's introduced in 1938. Okay, war happens in 1939, but it's not really getting stuck into any real kind of conflict until 1940. It takes a bit of a pasting and ends up being withdrawn in 1941, so two and a half-ish years from introduction to withdrawal from the front lines, even though it's still doing other tasks until pretty much the end of the war. Now, if you look at, say, something like the Zero, introduced mid to late 1940, so it's in service 1941, has its heyday in 1942, so two and a half years after introduction, you're looking at end of 42, early 43, and, well, the Zero is beginning to lose a little bit of its shine, and they're making new models to try and address that. And similarly, you look at the the Wildcat, the F4F, introduced in December 1940, goes to war in 41, has its heyday in 42, and halfway through 1943, it's being replaced by the Hellcat. Um, so the, the Blackburn Skewer, yeah, it's not an absolute world beater, but for its time, it was competitive, albeit not massively so as a fighter, and pretty good as a dive bomber. It just it suffered the misfortune of going to war against a relatively capable air force um, with land-based aircraft, which in the early part of the war are always superior to the carrier-based aircraft, generally speaking, at the very tail end of when, technologically speaking, it had any kind of acceptable performance left, and it was compromised by this hybrid design. So... Yeah, it's it's not the, really the kind of optimal aircraft you want to be flying around in 1940-1941, but it's not quite as awful as some of the memes and legends make it out to be. Travorius asks, Why did the Great Siege of Gibraltar fail? Were there lessons to be learned from the Great Siege that might have allowed Napoleon to succeed? Or was the lesson to be learned, don't bother trying? Well, there were three main elements to the Great Siege of Gibraltar, and to one extent or the other, the Franco-Spanish allies failed in all three of them. Um, so I suppose there is room for improvement, but there's some fairly fundamental reasons as to why they failed, which would affect Napoleon as well, because although he might have somewhat better organised uh, troops to a certain degree, he also has the, sort of the downside of a revolutionary war era French Navy. But regardless, on the land side of things, the fundamental problem you have, which un actually underlies all of these, is Gibraltar is a very small place, which makes it comparatively fairly easy to defend, even with musk and cannon technology of the period. And of course, the rock, which makes up the vast majority of Gibraltar, is an eminently defensible location, especially once in the middle of the Great Siege, the British had invented uh, garages that allowed them to depress their cannons, which then meant that not only could you have fortifications at the base of the rock, you could even build fortifications into the rock all the way up the sides and then take advantage of the extreme height to both be out of range of most of the enemy siege guns, but whilst their siege works were now in range of your extended range guns, but then if they tried to get closer, you could just depress the guns and keep on shooting them. So, yeah, the, the, from the land side of things, especially because you basically, especially pre the airport days, you have to advance over this killing ground that I've mentioned before. It's very narrow facing one of the uh, harder sides of the rock to attack. And not that there's an easy side, really. Um, one of the, the larger issues there is that Gibraltar being the thing that's being defended can have fixed batteries, fixed fortifications, lots of preparation and heated shop uh, furnaces, etc. Meanwhile, if you're advancing your siege works closer and closer to Gibraltar, you can't have that similar level of preparation and fortification in place. Your initial siege works are going to have to be a mixture of wood and mud um, and soil. 
anything else, anything heavier, rock, stone-based, etc., is going to take a lot of time to set up, and a lot of men. And if you're setting them up close enough to Gibraltar for you to shoot at it, they'll you're in range of Gibraltar shooting back at you. And one of the other things, is obviously, is that stonework takes a lot longer to do than basic woodwork and, and soil, which means you're exposed to enemy fire for a lot longer, so a lot of your valuable siege engineers will be killed. So because you have to make do with this kind of quick and simple wooden soil construction, it also means that the things are vulnerable to fire. So the British defensive guns can effectively create this zone, which is what they did, of just bombarding and destroying and bombarding and destroying your siege works. And the traditional way of dealing with something as heavily fortified and concentrated as Gibraltar is to surround it, but you can't surround it on land because it's on a, a little spit. So it li even limits the amount of troops that you can send forward all in one wave. So, I mean, Napoleon had a fairly good sense of artillery, so perhaps his artillery batteries would do slightly better, but that doesn't change the fundamental advantages that the defensive side of Gibraltar has on land. So there's not a tremendous amount he could do there other than perhaps have a slightly more effective artillery bombardment. But when it comes to the sea, well, there's two sides to it. There's the seaborne potential for attack, um, both in terms of floating batteries, which they tried, and in terms of landings, which were also contemplated. And then there's the other seaborne element, which is the blockade. Now, the seaborne attack element suffers from, uh, in the Napoleonic era, pretty much the same problems as the land attack side of things. Gibraltar is effectively just a solid lump of stone. You're going to be very hard-pressed to actually significantly reduce its defences with either a naval or land bombardment, and, as they showed, even specially made floating batteries that were designed to be proof against red-hot shot on cannon fire weren't actually proof against red-hot shot on cannon fire, under extreme prolonged bombardment. And again, without things like, say, the Crimean War era armoured floating batteries, there's not a lot Napoleon could do there either, although perhaps the coordination between the fleet and the floating batteries could be improved. Well, it should have been improved, but to be perfectly honest, you know, we're talking about, <laughs> again, the Revolutionary War uh, Napoleonic era French fleet, so expecting them to perform better in that role, I'm, I wouldn't be holding my breath. The last element, the blockade, though, that is pretty much the only area that was so sort of the biggest single threat to Gibraltar. Gibraltar was almost starved out a couple of times, so that's probably the easiest path to victory for a sort of great siege of Gibraltar Mark II. The problem that the great that those naval blockades had was that it was considered important enough for the British that when supplies got really low, they would send a massive convoy. You're talking about dozens up to 100 sh uh, convoy ships escorted by basically a battle fleet, two, three dozen ships of the line. And as long as the British battle fleet that strong is present and able to either slip through or blast its way through the Franco-Spanish blockade, there's even even a blockade is going to do precious little to you know make Gibraltar fall because as long as that convoy arrives well they'll just resupply in theory if Napoleon concentrated pretty much every ship of the line he had that could float in the entire Franco-Spanish fleet and put them all off Gibraltar in the form of one massive blockade that would probably form a fleet so large and so powerful, even with the detriments of being a Napoleonic era French fleet, that it, the Royal Navy could put together a fleet strong enough to try and blast through, but it would take a fair bit of time and would require Britain to call in ships from other commitments across the world, which they may not want to do. I mean, it robs the Franco-Spanish forces under Napoleon of the ability to deploy ships anywhere else in the world to capital ships to do anything particular but considering it's the British who are making the most gains on in that field it's probably not a tremendous issue as tremendous an issue for Napoleon as it would be for the British so potentially that might work you literally just carpet the Straits of Gibraltar in Franco-Spanish warships but that assumes that you know the British don't take it so seriously that they do actually marshal pretty much all of their ships to go up against all of Napoleon's ships for a grand battle in the Straits 
because that would probably go Britain's way. And it also assumes that, you know, the coordination of the Franco-Spanish fleet and the leadership would be sufficient that a uh, blockade running fleet couldn't just slip through anyway like they did several times during the Great Siege. So on paper, there are ways of getting around it. But in practicality, given the operational circumstances and realities of both 1800, early 1800s in naval technology and particularly the stuff that Napoleon himself had to work with, I can't see any way that he could massively overcome what was going on at the Great Siege if he was doing it. 308 Winchester asks, I've been looking into the design history of the Richelieu class battleships and was surprised to find that the design number one was chosen. In my opinion, considering the main reason for its design in the first place was the Littorio class battleships, why didn't they choose any of the other designs? Since the difference in speed between number four and the Littorios is negligible, and the French didn't have a concern about having to have fast carrier escort duty like the US did, the concern about that particular design being somewhat overweight seems to be irrelevant since it was probably going to be overweight regardless, and Richelieu was, in fact, massively overweight. So why did the French still choose the design with two quads over one with three triples? So for those of you who aren't aware, the French battleship Richelieu and its sister Jean Bart were originally conceived of via a number of different designs. As uh, the question indicates, Project 1 was what resulted in the Richelieu we all know and love with two quad turrets. Projects uh, three, four, uh, 2, 3 and 4 were somewhat weird. <laughs> um, they all used three turrets. They were all still all forward. Um, they didn't consider more conventional fore and aft layout, but they used a mixture of twins, quads, and triples. And for two and three, that's actually multiple combined. So either two triples and a twin, or two twins and a quad, and then three triples in Project 4. And then there was Project 5 and 5 bis, which let's not go into those because they are truly silly. Um, anyway, so those were the other options they were considering. Now, obviously, the French did have, well, the most experience working with quad turrets of anybody else since they'd started working on that kind of stuff in World War One, and obviously had just completed the Dunkirks. But when it comes to considering why didn't they go with three triples, a Nelson style, um, instead of the two quads that they did, there's really two main factors outside of they'd have to design a triple turret, which France had never done for a capital ship up to this point, whereas they had done twins and they had done quads. And, and those that other issues were, one, with two quads, you could get all-round fire with all guns, at least until you hit the stops. So obviously you'd have your, your um, dead space aft, but from the stops hard starboard facing mostly aft and hard port facing mostly aft with the two quad turrets you could get an eight gun salvo across that entire spectrum whereas if you used any of the other um, three turret designs because you're going to have to superimpose one turret above the others and they weren't going to go for you know three turrets all superimposed above each other dido or atlanta style it meant that there would be some bearing, usually the full front arc, where you could not fire all of your guns. Whereas, as you can see with this, Richelieu can fire all of her guns forward. So that's a disadvantage as well, uh, in terms of bringing effective firepower to bear. And then the final element, which really I think was the nail in the coffin, was that even though the quad turrets are somewhat larger the more guns you fit in a turret up to a certain point, the more efficiency you get out of the overall footprint of them. Three turrets, whether they be twins, quads, or triples, or whatever combination thereof they were using, in case number four, obviously three triples, took up a lot more space in the hull. So the ship would have to be longer, or possibly beamier, or both. Um, that if you and if you didn't do that, if you just tried to fit everything in, then you, the turrets would run further back. At which point, the machinery spaces get smaller, and thus the ship gets slower. 
Now, if that happens, well, one, you have a slower ship, which is not necessarily ideal because you're not, you've got to remember, it's not just for the French about the Latorios, it's about all the other cruisers and things that they might be facing off with. So bear in mind, you know, the French, they've got the Dunkirks, they're pretty quick. They've got their super destroyers, which are very, very quick. And they've got an Italian fleet, which, okay, the Latorios are, are pretty quick, but the Italian cruisers are even faster. You still want even if you don't necessarily have to worry immediately about carrier um, escort operations, although with the Joffre class being planned, perhaps they did, um, you still want to be as fast as possible to bring the enemy fleet to battle as much as possible and to give them the least possible opportunity to escape. So high speed's important. Richelieu's eventual project number one design was the fastest one that they could get. And the other part, apart from the speed and the all-round fire issues... In terms of being overweight, yeah, okay, Richelieu did finish overweight, but as designed, she was the least overweight of the various designs they were looking at. And completing overweight is not a good thing. It does affect your ship's performance. It does affect even things like how effective your ship's armor is going to be. So if you're faced with a design that's a couple of hundred tons, maybe a few hundred tons overweight, and a design that's a medium-sized destroyer's worth of displacement overweight, if you're probably confident at that point that the ships are probably going to complete even more overweight, you want to start from the minimum possible amount of, of having too much weight. Because if you accept, okay, well, here's our 35,000-ton battleship design, it's already... 13, 1,400 tons overweight, you're probably going to end up completing five or 6,000 tons overweight, at which point you may well actually end up with a ship that is unfeasible as a full-on fighting unit. Whereas if you're looking at 350 tons overweight, you might be able to shave that amount off. And if you and but even if it grows, it's not going to grow as bad. Captain Landlocked asks, I'm trying to get a better understanding of what makes a good admiral in World War II. To do so, I want to know how much they could decide on their own. Could you give me examples of decisions an admiral could make without checking with the rest of the admiralty, and at what, which point he had to get confirmation? Perhaps Cunningham would be a good example. It depends a lot on the rank of the admiral, because remember you can have you know rear admiral, vice admiral, full admiral, admiral of the fleet, etc. So they're going to have different levels of command delegation. And also, what are they sailing with in terms of a fleet because you could have uh, for example with say something like the British Pacific Fleet since you asked about Cunningham so let's use the Royal Navy as an example with the British Pacific Fleet you might have an overall chad admiral in charge of the whole fleet but there might be a number of subordinate admirals who might be in charge of the carriers the battleships the cruisers the anti-submarine escort force etc so in that ca case obviously the admiral of that the British Pacific Fleet would have a lot of command authority and flexibility whereas one of his subordinate admirals would have a lot less then you've also got to think about what is the environment that they're in so for example if you're talking about an admiral who's got command of a small force of cruisers hundreds or thousands of miles away from the mainland UK he's probably got a very wide degree of action that he can take Whereas if it's someone who is perhaps commanding the home fleet, which is obviously at home and represents a good chunk of British capital ship capability, whilst he's going to have, a, because he's going to be a fairly high rank, a certain degree of freedom, he also will need to refer back to London a lot more because A, London's a lot closer and they would expect him to do so, but B, you know, the risks commensurate with what he's doing are another factor then you have kind of the perfect balance in some ways which is why i think probably you mentioned cunningham and now we're coming around to him as commander-in-chief in the mediterranean he has an awful lot of operational flexibility he can ask for new ships for operations that he wants to undertake but even so some things are still constrained so for example if the admiralty says we need this convoy to go to malta to reinforce it because they did have uh, convoys that were run in from the Eastern Mediterranean occasionally as well, albeit not usually supply convoys, um, or we need to evacuate Crete or 
we need to support the desert rats or the eighth army generally or whatever these things come from on high cunningham doesn't have a choice in whether or not he does those things he has to do those things he's been ordered to but the amount of flexibility he's got on how he does that as long as the objective is accomplished is very different so for example if he's told right we need to get everyone off of crete because it's falling to the germans so he can make a good faith effort get off as many people as possible and say right actually no the risk to my fleet at this point was now too much and so i had to cut it there the admiralty in london would pretty much have to accept that because by the time they'd been told what was going on and possibly come to a different decision it'd be far too late or he could turn around and do what he's historically which says no we're just getting people out and you know almost disregard the losses we're getting these people out and that's a fairly wide range in latitude and the same thing so um the events that lead up to something like the battle of cape matapan there's allied supply convoys running to and from greece at this point he has to protect them you know he doesn't have a choice in that matter but how he chooses to protect them what proportion of his fleet he sends out there where he deploys them is he looking to be purely defensive and turtle up around the convoys is he looking to kind of loosely hang around in the area of the convoys and therefore have a bit more operational flexibility and look at if the italians come knocking is he sending formations out actively looking for the italians how strong are these formations all this kind of thing that is all something he has a very uh, widespread amount of control over and actually in an environment like that as opposed to something like the british pacific fleet where everyone's sailing in near enough speaking formation the subordinate admirals probably actually have a lot more freedom from the admiralty in london than they would otherwise because in something like the mediterranean cunningham will send out subordinate admirals to do certain roles at which point, you know, he might pre- Cunningham might present the overall plan in loose terms to London, or even just say, yeah, we're going to fulfil this objective you've given us. But he is sort of the interface between himself, uh, between the Admiralty and the lower admirals. So then he might then say, right, okay, I'm sending this force out. You're going to be in command of it. This is our objective. Here's what I'd like you to do. And it might be a very controlled way of doing things like Taranto, which had a very def- definitive schedule. But it might also literally be a case of, you know, here's our objective we need to protect. There's the enemy, which may come and stop us. You're going to be here. Kill them all. Which, of course, was an order near enough. <laughs> as makes no difference. He did actually issue at one point. Mark AG asks, I have a professional interest in gunnery. So how accurate were naval guns through the time period you cover, i.e. in World War II, on a car motion under practice conditions? Was a naval salvo better, worse? What about World War I, Age of Sail, Age of Iron and Steam, etc., etc.? Uh, secondly, I think you may have missed a question a couple of months ago. I mean, it depends a lot on the guns. Um, you could get very accurate naval guns, you could get horrendously inaccurate naval guns, and then you had kind of the average plus it also depends on what ranges you're shooting at now obviously the long wednesday video i've done on naval gunnery goes into this in a lot more detail but but basically the short version is by world war ii naval guns were superbly accurate in and of themselves the problem they had was in terms of you know hitting the target one firing platform and target are both moving in three dimensions quite considerably and the physical conditions that those shells are traveling through actually change all the way through to the other side in ways that the technology of the time just simply could not predict and to be honest i think even today we'd have problems predicting and measuring it along the entire flight path because you're talking about ranges such that a shell could leave the barrel of a gun with a certain humidity a certain air pressure a certain wind speed wind direction overall temperature etc and so on and all of those factors could change quite considerably at least three or four times during its flight so at the apogee of its flight just to take one point of example it will have reached high enough that the air pressure is different how different 
well, you, there's the basic altitude, but it could be high pressure systems, low pressure weather systems. Uh, it's obviously going to be theoretically colder, um, but it might not be. If it's going through a cloud layer, if it's very cold under the cloud layer and breaks through clouds into warm sunshine, well, it might actually be warmer when you take into account surface heating. Um, the wind speed and direction might be completely different. It might have flown, it might fly through a rain squall. Um, and then by the time it starts descending again, it, so it's descending back into higher pressure air, which might be going in a complete third direction with a completely different set of humidities and temperatures and so forth. So, you know, even if in a completely calm, completely measured, it's kind of, I guess, testing ground environment, the shell might go exactly here. In real life, that gun might shoot somewhere-ish in that vicinity. So when you fire a gun in World War II at those kinds of ranges, you're probably looking for a battleship. The its main guns, if it's if the gun is accurate to within about through two to three hundred yards of the aim point, this is good. Uh, kind of twenty to twenty-five thousand yards. If it's three to four, maybe pushing up to 450 yards. It's all right. It's about what you'd expect. And if it's much over 450, 500 yards, then it's horrifically inaccurate. Um, so that's kind of what, what you're talking about. World War One. you're probably talking about a bit, obviously a bit less accurate, but then commensurately the ranges are also lower. So the number of potential factors in play is somewhat less so spreads were probably a fraction wider but probably not more than 50 yards wider for like for light comparisons in terms of this is a good gun this is a bad gun this is an okay gun once you get back to the age of sail and the age of iron and steam the age of sail with smoothbore cannon is somewhere over there maybe um, if you have a particularly good set of picked ammunition and a particularly good gun you could get surprisingly accurate and at several hundred up to a thousand yards actually you use a cannon kind of like a giant sniper rifle but generally speaking unless you're at a range that's so point blank as to make no difference because you could literally hit the broadside of a barn because that's the only thing you can see um once you get up past more than a few hundred yards it's kind of you might hit something ship size or somewhere in the vicinity of something ship size whereas in the calm conditions if you asked a world war ii naval rifle to fire at a thousand yards range you'd almost be asked okay sir which portholes you want me to put the shell through and i suppose in some ways one of the best ways of measuring all of this is to a certain degree looking at rail guns in world war one and world war two not electromagnetic rail guns rail guns as in big guns mounted on railway tracks because those tended to be naval guns because they were too big for most general field deployment and so with those kinds of things you take away some of the external factors involved in ship-based weaponry so you can eliminate pitch roll movement etc because your target's hopefully not moving you are hopefully not moving so all you have to factor in is wind and weather conditions uh, and such like now obviously that will still have an effect but you can if you have a look at a well-planned series of shoots by a railgun that is effectively a naval gun on land that'll give you a lot closer idea of how accurate the gun itself is as opposed to how accurate is the gun when it's had all these other conditions externally thrown at it so that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening um no major channel admin although for some of you it might be first thing um there is a small and i do stress at this moment small possibility that i might be able to make some form of abbreviated u.s trip in late september this year that's purely because in the last week or so there's been some tentative announcements that the US might, and again I stress might, be looking at opening up travel to some UK and European visitors at some point in the next few weeks. So if that happens, then I might be able to make it over to the States 
for some form of visit. Now, obviously, trying to book flights with probably at that point probably two two weeks notice of when everything's going to be taking off and the fact obviously all the internal flights and hotel bookings etc in the US will have been going on as normal it'll be expensive um, plus I can guarantee you there'll be a massive rush of people from the EU and the UK who are trying to get into the states at the same time so even though the plane tickets will only be being sold within like a week or two of the announce of the sort of flights about to take off i can guarantee you the prices will spike quite high as well so if i manage to pull <coughs> something like that off it will not be able to be the full tour that i wanted to do um i can probably go for about two weeks and anything less really isn't worth it considering the amount of time it takes to get across to the states um anything more and at that kind of short notice i wouldn't be able to have you know three weeks plus worth of channel content just like that out of the blue um so i would have to i would have to be limited to either around about two weeks or maybe just under and i'd have to limit the number of places that i'm going uh, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I would probably m only visit two or three places, and but just spend a lot of time at those two or three places uh, to keep costs down, and then head back. But it would at least mean I've got to get to visit something um, and get some content, because, for example, you know, not necessarily say necessarily saying these will be the places I visit, but if i i've said for a quite a while i don't want to do a des moines class five minute guide just yet because uss salem exists you know if i can get there and see salem it would be much better for me to do a five minute guide where i can instead of saying oh yeah the ship had a bunch of auto loading eight inch um guns i can go look here are the eight inch auto loading guns you know it's it's just much better content so there's that element to things um, but also in terms of, you know, how much time is available for each of those places. So anyway, short form version, possibly be able to head to the States, but if so, it will be a very truncated, shortened visit. I'll just have to come back next year. Um, and, uh, I know I said that last year, but you know, well, I'm not in charge of the global pandemic. Um, anyway, the other factor which some of you will hopefully be quite interested in a little bit of cross-channel promotion going on um is those of you who are also subscribers to military aviation history and military history visualized will know they have a new book coming out um this one is on the stuka the junkers 87 um so why would you lot as people interested in naval history be interested in it well of course well two reasons one there was a navalized version of the ju87 that was developed just never got to go anywhere because graf zeppelin wasn't completed and secondly there were an awful lot of ju87s that caused an awful lot of problems for an awful lot of allied ships in the mediterranean and elsewhere at the hands are uh, you sort of with german and italian pilots at the helms so it's a fairly important aircraft from both sides of the equation to be perfectly honest or at least when it comes to german aircraft and the interface with naval technology so if you would like to have a look and see how their new book campaign is going maybe get a copy for yourself etc link will be in the description below and uh i well i've personally already backed it so um it has my my uh recommendation as well so yeah go and have a look um it's going to be as with some of their previous, well, as with all their previous books, translated from original German documents. And as far as anyone can tell, this is the, probably the first time that these documents have been translated into English. So you're going to be getting your hands either on some information that's never been read in the English language before, or if it has been, it's been read only by bilingual dedicated researchers who have then summarized it somewhere probably in a few paragraphs or a footnote somewhere in, in a book possibly um so yeah go and have a look i'm looking forward to the bit on the naval ice obviously surprise surprise um 
but also just definitely worth supporting in terms of supporting their channels as well because they are excellent history channels and uh, I am uh, friends with both of them so yay go go have a look at that with that said thank you very much for listening and hope to see you again in another video